The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com, IgnitionAPG.com, PlayUSA at PLAEUSA.com, and Soranex Exercise Equipment at Soranex.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeever. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeever's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeever. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 158. Excited to have Tommy Heffernan with us. Tommy is the head strength coach at the University of Hawaii. He's been there for quite some time, and a guy I've gotten a chance to get to know through the years, does a, does a phenomenal job. Um, you know, I wanted to have him on the show for, for a couple reasons. One, you know, I've, I've always been fascinated by uh, the Hawaiian culture and just the unique aspect that that brings to working at a place like Hawaii that may be something like you know BYU where you know it's kind of a heavy Mormon or Hawaii where it's heavy Polynesian or uh, some of these other schools that have a distinct culture and coming in and and, and being able to uh, adapt and and interact and and uh, and do all those types of things and so uh, we dive into that we talk a little bit about being um uh, you know, kind of off the mainland and how the, the challenges that, that, that come about with that. Uh, we talk about his clinic. He runs a fantastic clinic around the Pro Bowl uh, that I think is a great one that, that people should attend. And um, just a lot of really, really good things uh, in this episode. And so I want you to, to sit back and enjoy. But before we do, I want to make sure we recognize our sponsor for this episode, Play USA. Uh, got a chance to hang out with Brett Waits at the Sornex Summer Strong uh, this, this couple weeks ago or past week. And uh, just a phenomenal guy. I mean, a guy that's taken this company to a whole nother level. Uh, some really big things coming from play. And, um, you know, just every time I've walked away from Rich or Brett or uh, any of the uh, people that, that work at play, uh, it's just such a great team. And, and, um, and, and like I said, you know, they got a common mission uh, to impact strength and conditioning on a, on a big level. And I uh, can't say enough great things about them. Make sure you're following them on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, they're always putting out great stuff. I love seeing the different facilities that they keep putting together. Um, they by far are the best uh, flooring company out there. And so if you're in the market, reach out to them. But uh, if you're not and you see them at a conference, uh, make sure you just uh, tell them how much you appreciate them being involved with the show and, and supporting that. And so this comes to you for free. So I want to get to this episode. Sit back and, and enjoy Take lots of notes, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. Excited to have a buddy of mine on the show today, Tommy Heffernan, down in the University of Hawaii. Tommy, we go back probably what, probably ten years or so now. Yeah, at least uh, ten. Yeah, at least ten, and uh, you know you've been in Hawaii for quite some time, and you've always done a fantastic job. And uh, we've been trying to set this up for a while, just the time difference and the whole thing. It's it's been tough, but uh, man, I'm really I'm really happy that you're on the show, man. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. You do an awesome job. Uh, like I said, I'm glad I could be finally uh, be on track and be a part of this awesome thing that you do and help strength coaches and help share the word with everybody else. So thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that, brother. Well, hey, man, I want to I want to go through your journey a little bit. I mean, you've been uh, you've been at Hawaii for quite some time, but kind of how how you got into strength and conditioning and then what what led you there to Hawaii? Well, um, I actually am an alumni of the University of Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Honolulu, from the North Shore, uh, played high school football, baseball. I was fortunate enough to come to the university on a scholarship. Uh, that's the only way I was going to go to college. Yeah. A lot of us out here, I mean, we got to find a way to get to college. And athletics, for most of us, is that path. So I was very fortunate after graduating from St. Louis High School, got a chance to play football and baseball at the University of Hawaii. Um, but tell you the truth, uh, in school, my my I was looking at going to teaching, education. I wanted to go and help kids and do what my dad did. He was a coach mm-hmm. for a long yeah. time and worked with kids. And I seen how much uh, positive impact he had on a lot of lives. And I wanted to do the same thing. So my path kind of took a 
a, a, a left turn because um, uh, out of college I was planning to go back and teach and I actually was teaching out in my hometown at Kahuku High School. Um, I was a teacher in I taught Hawaiian history, Hawaiian language, and then I was coaching baseball and football um, besides teaching. Um, but uh, I mean, once I was in a classroom setting, staying within those four walls was tough for me. I mean, I had a hard time staying there all day and athletics was always itching, itching and I always wanted to get back into athletics. Then I got a call from the University of Hawaii. Um, one of the guys who I volunteered with, Coach Curtis Saruda, he was here in Hawaii. Yep. And he asked me, hey, Tom, you want to come back to university? I said, what, what do you got? I mean, uh, I'm not happy with what I'm doing, but I need to know what you're doing. He said, well, we got a job, but it's a part-time position. So I had to make a big decision back then. Do I give up my full-time job? Doing pretty good. Um, just coming out of college. Um, and then giving that up and starting all over again from scratch and coming to be an assistant, assistant with Coach Curtis. And after talking to my dad, he said, son, you do whatever that, whatever makes you happy. That's what you do. And I took his advice, and I've been here for the last 22 years now. So That's awesome. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I made a good big chance. I took a chance, and I busted my butt for five years as an assistant, working 60 hours a week, getting paid for 20, scraping by. I think I made like $300 every two weeks. And that was just enough for me to pay for my rent when I was staying uh, in town. I, I would walk to work, walk home. I mean, I was just scraping by, and I did that for five years. And the reason why I mentioned it, and during those five years, I, I never really thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. is because mm -hmm. I was happy, and Absolutely. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the grind. I enjoyed coming to work, working with all our teams. Um, and, and, I mean, that was – it taught me a lot because there were just two of us at the time – and the two of us did 18 sports. So you can see how much um, teams would have each day coming in and out on a constant basis. And doing that over and over again made me such a better coach. Taught me how to be a better time management, how to uh, move teams, teams in and out, how to work with different coaches. Absolutely. So that, 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 that gave me a great understanding of what strength and conditioning was. And uh, I'm very, very grateful to Coach Saruda for giving me the opportunity. And that's all. Bunch of us. All we need is one guy to give us a chance. And if we get the chance, then you can do the job. So I'm glad I had the chance. And my, my road kind of took a turn uh, from teaching to getting back into the strength and conditioning field. Well, I think, we, I think we'd both agree that as strength coaches, we teach on a daily basis. And, so, and some of those best strength coaches are the best teachers. And, and so there's no doubt that you've uh, brought that into this, this, the weight room there. But 22 years, I mean, uh, lots of things to pull out of that story. I mean, one, you got to take a chance, right? You gotta, you gotta, you know, it's never going to be clear, a clear decision, a clear picture. You took a chance, you know, part-time job. You're making full-time money as a teacher, I'm sure. Didn't, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Probably look, people looked at you a little crazy, but, but it made you happy, like you said. And, um, you know, that's what it is. You got to have it. You got to want to do this job for free, uh, to make it, I think, you know, sometimes, exactly. you know, but, uh, you know, I, I would say this, I mean, 22 years, I mean, that's, you've, you've got to be one of the longest tenured strength coaches out there. What, what's the secret? I mean, how do you, la how do you last at a place for 22 years? I mean, being an alumni helps, I'm sure, but in this dog eat dog world of college athletics, I mean, it, it, you know, sometimes, you know. That stuff goes by the wayside. What have been some of the things that you've done through your career there at Hawaii to kind of position yourself as a staple in the athletic department? Um, well, I've learned a lot over the years, made many mistakes um, looking back at how I did things in the beginning. I think uh, there's a couple of recommendations I would give to all new strength coaches. I think number one is uh, to listen when you come in, I know you have a lot of different ideas and you want to you hit the road running full speed and do your own things, but the best thing you could process is, is do is just sit down and listen to the people you're working with. Let them share their ideas first, and then when they have a chance to get everything off their chest, and then, then you can probably input your uh, wisdom, your philosophy, your ideas, but just letting them have that opportunity shows them that you respect them sure. and that you can to listen. And then once they feel that they, you, you have that common courtesy, I mean, that kind of opens up the door to a little bit more different things. And then number two, you have to earn people's respect. 
You have to work for it. You have to show them that you don't only care about the winning and losing. You care about them as people, as players, as coaches, and the program. Um, I think I try to do that with all my teams. No matter if they're uh, swimming or golf, I, I train them and I gave them the attention like they're the best team on our campus. And that's one thing I try to do in all of our sports. I treat them equally and fairly and try to give them the best job I can and so that they, when they walk out the door to say, I mean, Coach Tommy cares about us, about us and our team. Um, I try to do that with all of our teams. Um, like I said, it wasn't like that at the beginning, but I learned, learned those things over the years and building those relationships. And it doesn't, ha- it doesn't hurt to be friendly and humble. Sure. I mean, you don't have to go around and push your weight around. Um, this is what I do. This is, what I want to, this is the way it's going to be done. I mean, a lot of times action and the way you treat people is the best way to, to encourage their support and loyalty. And I try to do that. I try to be humble and work hard and let them sh- and show by my actions and not by my words. Yeah. So I think building those relationships over the years, especially when I, as, as I started, most of my work was with the smaller sports when I first came on. Teams that nobody really cared about. Right. When you have two guys running 18 sports, you're going to have like five or six teams that, hey, just come in and do whatever you want. I kind of leaned toward those teams when I started and kind of guiding those guys and teaching them and coaching them up. And they really appreciated me doing that at a time when I really didn't need to. Mm-hmm. And as the years developed, they, they understood that hey, Coach Tommy did this when he didn't have to. And that kind of built my relationship with a lot of the coaches and the players and administration, and I think um, doing it consistently over time, that kind of helped me uh, with my relationship with, with, with our department. And I think that's huge too. You got to have great communication and great relationships with all the people you work with, not only coaches but our ATCs, our equipment people, academics, and men. I mean, you should be able to walk into their office and and, and have conversations and be able to communicate like I mean like you were friends and, and that's the approach I take here in Hawaii. No, that's great. That's tons of great advice in there. You know, mentioned you mentioned some of those mistakes, you know, that you've made through the years. I mean we've all made millions of mistakes day, you know, doing daily, but what's what's maybe the biggest mistake that you made as a coach? Um, and then how you how you learn from that to grow into a better coach? Um I think one of the first ones I made, like I said, uh, I was very eager uh, when I was younger, and I wanted to do things my way. I wanted to, to um, I, I was kind of blocked off to different um, training uh, philosophies and programs. And I think uh, one of the mistakes I made is we, we had some different philosophies uh, at the time, and I wasn't buying into some of the philosophies. And I think that kind of showed, um, and and that kind of put me in a bad spot early with some people because I was I was I really didn't see it that way. But at the when I look back at it, I say, you know what, that probably wasn't what the best thing to do. You should have just been humble and quiet and listen and learn. Right. And then at, when you get your opportunity, then you can make your move and try and do some different things. I think I rushed into trying to be more aggressive and waiting and not waiting for my opportunity and trying to seize the opportunity instead of waiting my turn for my shot. And uh, look, looking back at that, that was a good lesson for me. I learned that that wasn't the right thing to do, and I encourage guys not to make the same mistake that I did. Yeah, that's great advice. You know, at the University of Hawaii, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's obviously an island, and it's, and it's its own little, own culture, you know, um, of, of people, of, of community, of, of a place. You know, I always kind of uh, you know talk about what my time at South Florida when you're coaching Florida kids. Florida kids are a little bit different than than the rest of the country, you know. And I, I would assume California would say the same thing, and Texas, and and on and on and on. But you're in a unique setting there. How much have you, you know, and not only that, but you taught you know Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian language and and the whole thing, you know, coming into uh, you know the university there. How have you been able to balance the, the culture of the community with the university and, and with your program? Um, you're totally correct. Each 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 uh, demographic or section of uh, where you're at, the people are different. And definitely we're different here in Hawaii. We have a good majority, of, uh, a good portion of our players are Polynesian. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at mm-hmm. kids from all over the South Pacific, 
including Hawaii, Samoa, Tonga, um, New Zealand, um, Tahiti. And then we have an influx of uh, overseas players as well uh, from Europe. Right. So we're very, very different than uh, most places. Uh, the one thing I try to do is relate to those people, our, our Polynesian players especially, I mean, those guys and girls respond differently to training. Um, they're very family-oriented, very quiet, um, non-confrontational. You wouldn't think that looking at Polynesian players that they're, right. they're like that, but that's the way they're born. They don't speak up because you're taught to be quiet. If you draw attention to yourself, that means you're, you tr you're being a show-off. So understanding the way the mentality is and how they approach things, you have to have your teaching style in that manner. So with most of, most of our Polynesian players, I try to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. I mean, a lot of encouragement, pulling them on the side, talking to them, and not putting them in confrontation situations. Because I mean, that's the worst thing you can do right. with those guys. Because that's kind of like you're, you're humiliating them in front of everybody when it shouldn't be that way. You can just pull them off on the side and a one-on-one, hey, -on -one, hey, I think you're not doing a good job with it. And explain the situation. And they'll have so much more respect for you. All they want to do yeah. is be told and shown respect, and they'll run through a freaking wall for you. Yeah, I mean, that's where, and and different players are different ways, and you got to adjust to different players from the mainland. For Florida, I probably would do totally different from that. Yeah, and you have different specs, you know what I'm saying? And so, as a coach, I've learned how to talk to and uh, communicate with different players, see what what worked best to get those guys or girls motivated. And for us. Sometimes you got to take a step away and just talk to guys on the side, get them going. What I like to do as well, being my, my, uh, my ethnicity and my background in Hawaiian history and language, I like to share stories and um, things that came up in our history to help motivate these guys and let them understand that in Hawaii, I mean, we don't only represent the University of Hawaii. We represent the whole Pacific. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing you need. We represent Tonga, Samoa, New Zealand. Hawaii, all together. So when we can do that and, and have them understand the mentality of what this university represents, then it makes it a whole new level. Pride takes a whole new level. Right. And, and then what I try to do as well is throw in different stories. Say we meet on Monday, I'll tell them a story about King Kamehameha when he went into battle. When King Kamehameha, he was the first king that united all the Hawaiian Islands. When he was born, they had to rush him away from his parents because they was going to kill him. Because they knew a, the king was born in that night and they was hunting out for all those newborn kids. But he rose through power in the end as the underdog. <laughs> and, they, and when he took over his island on the big island, the first island in the chain, and he, he paddled. Can you imagine a thousand war canoes paddling from the big island to Maui to, to invade Maui with 40 guys at each canoe? Wow. And, then, and then they get to the beach on Maui, and he calls all his men and all his captains, and he says, cut the lashings, flip the canoes. He basically tells the guys, Basically, he telling them, move forward, my brethren. Let's drink the bitter waters of battle, because there is no turning back. <laughs> going to freaking win and take this island or we're going to die. That's awesome. That's the kind of mentality I try to preach with these kids. These are the people we represent. These are the kind of warriors that represented Hawaii. So when you wear the Hawaii on your chest, when you call yourself warriors, you better take a second look of who you're representing and you better not be acting like a little sissy. Right. I mean, so I just try to incorporate the cultural part with our training just so they can have a better understanding of who we are, what we represent, and who they represent. So I'll, that's I'll awesome. try to incorporate a bunch. Oh, that's awesome. And that's, what, that's one of the great things about being at a place like that is having that kind of history and, kind of, and, and being able to tie it into exactly what you're doing and draw upon it. I think that's fantastic. You, you mentioned, you know, when you first got there, there's there's two coaches. You've grown it to, I think you said there's seven of you now, right? Four full-time and three GAs or something, right? Yes, you know, and so you you've done that as a de as a department head. You've been able to grow that. How have you come across 
Uh, how have you been able to a show a need and b be able to provide the resources to to, to get those types of positions created and and I'm sure that the the annual budget probably has grown from that time to now as well. So some of the things that you're doing from a fundraising and and just uh, you know finding resources for your department. Uh, yeah, when I first started, like I could mention there was only two of us. Uh, that was pretty crazy, and um, I just tried to look at different ways. Um, areas that we weren't tapping into to get more help. One of the first things I did was talk to our kinesiology department people and see if they had students that was interested in just interning sure. and volunteering with us. So that kind of opened up some things where we got a couple kids uh, starting just interning um, in the beginning. Later on, I started taking money that was budgeted toward our student employment and I tried to get funds through student employment that we could actually pay some of those kids to help them out. And then it, eventually I started work, trying to work deals with our administration right. where, hey, I'll take all the money you're giving me for my students. Can I get my, can I get my first GA? And that kind of opened one GA. Right. So I did that once. And then I, and I, I would work to inv individual coaches as well. Like, hey, coach, can you guys throw some money in here? And what I would do is try and accumulate from all the different areas and then build another spot. But and then I think over the year, the years, the the work we did with the kids, the 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 way the teams performed and the coaches, I think administration and then going to our conferences really helped me. Because then what I did was I just I prepared data. I got data from different schools, different people who I met at conferences comparing the numbers and then every year I'll go to our uh, they would have our budget meetings and I'll represent I'll present today hey, this is what they're doing across the country in our conference in different conferences this is how much teams they have this is how many coaches they have and I'll do that year after year and that finally I got the wheels moving and we got some positions created right. uh, so the, that helped a lot and then we also do our own fundraising I write grants every year I apply for grants and with those grants, we're able to do some things and help with our um, with our students and our GAs. And then I do our uh, national, our um, annual clinic, our Hawaii Strength Clinic. The original idea behind that was to give back to our community. Um, it's a professional opportunity, um, development opportunity to give back to our local high school coaches because you know, as a coach, especially at the high school level, you don't get paid. Right. You never Everything is done for free and for love. And after going to all of our national conferences, I said, you know what? This would be awesome if we could bring something like this in a smaller level back to Hawaii, just so our coaches could just come and learn and just take it back and help the kids and hopefully give them a chance to go to college. So um, that's why we created the Strength and Conditioning Clinic. And it's a two-fold event now where our priority is professional development, giving back to our community and our coaches, and then we've been also fortunate enough to where we actually make money off the clinic. Now the funds we derive from the clinic goes back into our account. And now we can use that funds to help our, our staff grow and provide. And that's actually how we go to our conferences because our clinic. Right. Um, we, we raise money from that and then try to get other sponsors to help us out. But to get our guys to clinic so they can uh, get better at what they do. But the process has been pretty long, I've been here, what, 20 years already, and to see it grow, it's been growing slowly, I like to see it grow a little faster, but <laughs> we at all least we're making progress, and uh, we also started a professional intern program now, where we have, we only select three students who are really interested in going into the field of strength and conditioning, and we take them on, under our wing uh, for the semester, uh, and we teach them as much as we can, and then we also have a maintenance intern and those guys are guys just trying to figure out what they want to do. But with those guys, they kind of help us with the facility maintenance, with our projects, with our clinics. So that's been a blessing for us as well. We have a lot of kids um, that want to do that. So that's been something new that we've been working on the last couple of years. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, you know, I want to draw on two things there. One is, you know, you said write, writing grants or, or applying for grants. What, you know, if somebody was, you know, a strength coach anywhere in the country is, is interested in doing something like that. Where are you finding these grants and, and kind of, you know, what can you expect from that process? 
Uh, the grants, I, I, I do local grants here in Hawaii. Um, I try to look, look for, uh, talk to some people in the kinesiology department, see what kind of grants they have that we might be able to um, um, be able to qualify for. I look for at, um, because we have a lot of uh, Polynesians, I look at for Native Hawaiian grants. Um, I apply for those as well. And then we also have some foundational grants with some people tied to the university. So if you have people that are alumni through athletics or academics, if you can look up those guys that have that want to give back to the school, especially you have a bunch of those guys that want to do that. Right. That's yeah. the area I hit, um, and these guys are alumni, and I hit, I, I apply to them every year, and they've been pretty um, generous to us, uh, uh, helping our department, and then the Office of Hawaiian Affairs or the Native Grants. So those two areas I hit, and then. I try to get one more either in the academic field or another community grant. But the closer you can get it to your school, um, the more uh, ties you have with the school, with the grant, I think that gives you a better chance uh, to get some uh, additional funds for your program. Yeah. And it can, it can be cash. It can be uh, for equipment, computers. I mean, anything helps. And I, I've done everything over the, the past uh, years. Yeah, it's creative. Well, and you mentioned the clinic. I mean, I, I would say that it. I mean, obviously, there's there's enough of you know population there to fill a clinic for sure. But you know, when you put on a clinic, it's not just you know uh, you're you're pulling from all you know 50 states. You're you're pulling you know uh, people from you know the the main the you know, mainland to, to come out. You know, so it's not just a, an easy process to put on a clinic for you. You know, I I, I would th- I would venture to say it's probably twice as difficult in all these different areas. Talk about maybe some of the strategies that you've used to, to promote your clinic and to um, and, and to have some creative funding to be able to, to support bringing it. You know, you bring, you've brought speakers in from everywhere, you know. So how have you gone about doing that? Um, like I said, I think the one strength about our clinic is our, our mission, and it is to give back to the community. And that's the one thing that, that helps us uh, with our sponsors. Um, I, I prepare a short letter, tell them why, what we're doing, why we're doing it, who it's going to affect, and I share with different sponsors. And we've been very fortunate to have some great sponsors over the year, and it's been growing. And I think they see the mission and the value that we're trying to do. We're trying to give back to the community, which eventually is giving back to the kids because we want the coaches to take the info back and help our kids get to college. And that's the, that's what we're trying to do, but like you said, it's it's a ton of work. We're bringing people from all over the country, East Coast, uh, West Coast, uh, Midwest, now from South. And what we try to do is we try to bring um, quality. No, I want to say the best. We try to bring in the best every year, whoever can make it. I know we try to get you one year. You're busy, but we we we'll work on that one again. Yeah. But we try to bring best coaches to share their knowledge and experiences so that they can go back and be successful and help kids. Um, and I think when the sponsors come, because we invite them to come to our clinic, when they come and see what we're doing, how we do it, then they get excited and they want to be a part of it even more. And we're very fortunate that everyone who has jumped with us in the beginning is still with us. And we're getting some other guys that are jumping on board now that see what we do and they enjoy it. And then they see the mission and they see the rewards and why we're doing it. Um, we had uh, McDonald's jumped on this past year, and they're very excited. They want us to take it to the next level. We had Queens Hospital wow. jumped on. So we, we, we got bigger guys that want to be playing a more, more role, a key role in our clinic. And But but what we do with our clinic is a little bit different now. We, 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 we treat our speakers very well when they come in. We fly them in, put them up, take care of them. And we ask them to just share their passion, share their knowledge when they come to Hawaii. Um, when we have socials at the end of the evenings on Friday and Saturday, all the speakers are there. They're mingling with the, the, the attendees. We're enjoying each other's company. So it's, it's very hands-on. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. We, everybody get a chance to talk one-on-one to each other you know, and just share your, your, your experience. And we do that for a couple of days. We feed everybody. Everybody has a great time. And we, the key is we try to keep the cost at a minimal. We try to keep it as cheap as possible so everybody can come. 
or work out something with our sponsors so we didn't get a we sponsor so many guys so we can especially like the schools that I mean they're very um challenge uh, sure. financially so we try to like I tell when I meet and I meet with uh, with the uh, local ads uh, across the state at their meetings and I tell them you know what I know not everybody can afford it but if you guys coaches want to come I'll find a way for your coaches to make their clinic and I meet with them every year and I express that this is this clinic is especially for them. That's why we made this clinic. But um, it's been going, I think, seven years now. And I'll keep on doing it as long as I can, as long as I can help other people. That's awesome, man. Well, hey, we, we, we finished the show with some resources typically. Give, give us the, the best piece of coaching advice you've ever received. Oh, oh. when I first started a while back, uh, Coach Vince Gu. He's our head of our women's basketball team. And in his 10 years here in Hawaii, he graduated 100% of his players. Wow. 100%. And that's the thing I respect the most about Coach Gu. And one time he told me, Tommy, you know what? You can teach coaches. Or you can teach people how to be better coaches. But the one thing you cannot teach is loyalty. And that's the one thing I learned early uh, from Coach Gu about loyalty. And that's probably the most important thing in any profession. You got to surround yourself with people that care about you and got your back uh, when anything goes down. So no, I couldn't agree more. What about a, um, a book, apps, app, and website recommendation? Book. Hey, I got a good one. CEO Strength Coach. <laughs> Don't say that's that. Shout out. That's, uh, no, no, I, I just started, that. like I told you earlier, Yeah, I started that one, and then that got me going, it got me thinking, Yeah, and just, it reminds me of all the things you do as a coach. It's not just coaching. I mean, there's a ton of different things, like I shared with the class just the other day. I spoke at a, one of our uh, um, classes here. I told him, I mean, you wear many hats, Right. It changed, and things change uh, constantly, and you got to be able to move with change. And your priorities change over time, and your responsibilities change over time, but you still got to work hard. I agree. I agree. No, I appreciate that. Well, turn turn around and look on your shelf and pick one of those ones off the off your shelf there. You know what? I got that. They're reading it in that class now. I left it with the instructor. Which one's that? Your uh, oh, well, this one's here. Yeah, I'm just, oh. I, I'm just saying a, a different book besides the CEO Strength Coach. Oh, okay. I like this one from my man Dan Austin, powerlifting. Oh, there you go. That's a yeah, that's a great one. Book. That's a great one. What about a, an app and a website that you, you check out typically? It's that Excel Excel athletes with Coach um, Cal Dietz. Yeah, that's a great one too. That's good, man. Well, brother, I know you know. I know you're busy, um, but um, you know the the things that I know about you, and, and you know, a uh, obviously your passion for you know your for the job, but also more so for the university community. I mean, that that's ultimately why we do what we do, you know. But the other thing that I've I've always respected from afar is just the type of father you are. You know, I mean, you, you, your kids are your life, and and. Uh, Man, I, I really expect, I respect that. I respect the fact that you've been in this business, you know, killing it for 22 years at one place. And, and uh, man, I appreciate you, the friendship, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much. You do a great job. And uh, like I said, I'm just super happy I'm able to uh, make the time and come out and help you and your, your podcast. You guys do an awesome job. Look forward to seeing you guys uh, hopefully in Dallas. Yeah. yeah we got to work. We got to get you out here sometime for. Or you gotta let me know what your schedule's like. Absolutely. So we can bring you out here to your knowledge with our people in Hawaii. That'd be great. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. 
If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.